All right, uh, so a couple of things real quick before I launch into this. Um, I'm going to assume that that most of you have or are at least vaguely familiar with setting up an AWS account. I'm not going to walk through the creation of an account. Uh, if we have anyone joining us who doesn't already have an AWS account uh, or has any questions about that, uh, we're welcome any questions on that after we walk through this. Uh, or you can also communicate with us and probably most people in the group through the Magic City Slack AWS channel. And uh, we'll share some links to that after the demo today with, uh, with the attendee list. Uh, but uh, definitely happy to support anybody with that setup. Uh, I do assure you it is an extremely fast, extremely easy setup to get an AWS account if you don't already have one. Uh, it can be done within a, a couple of minutes. There's just not a way to do it without showing your credit card number on screen. So we'll, we'll skip that part today. Um, the uh, workspaces is a, the Amazon workspaces solution is essentially a pay as you go type of service. You pay for what you use. Uh, there are options, there are a number of different options. You can pay monthly for the different workspaces. Uh, or you can pay hourly, which is a really nice setup if you only need a, a high performance desktop for a certain type of operation only occasionally. We pay for it while you're using it instead of, you know, constantly having a monster desktop for some specific process. Uh, similar thing in these, in these emergency circumstances, you don't have all the overhead of creating a vast VDI infrastructure for something that may be temporary or limited capacity. Uh, but of course, you know, the, the specific use case we'll be speaking to today and the version of this that we'll be using does fall within this free tier that's available for 50 spaces through the end of June. All right, so uh, a few things on workspaces. Um, workspaces is Amazon's, essentially uh, the AWS answer to a VDI a cloud-based VDI solution. It is a managed secured desktop as a service offering. Uh, it's based on the PC OIP, PC over IP protocol by Terry Dici, uh, meaning that it'll work with a lot of existing hardware thin clients that are out on the market already. Uh, a lot of good solutions there for, you know, more um, focused, you know, long-term uses of this. Um, that, Protocol can, uh, for anybody who's not familiar with this sort of thing, uh, PC over IP is essentially a streamed desktop uh, remote display protocol, uh, renders the client desktops over a network. Um, this solution does, we're not gonna get into it today, the solution does have extensive capabilities to join a, an Active Directory, an existing Active Directory on-premise uh, service that you have. Uh, there is the AWS's AD connector that can be used to join this or a number of other AWS services and apps to your local domain where you can use your existing directory structure for provisioning users and access to this. We'll be using um, a uh, sort of the built-in AWS's directory for the, the simple uh, exercise of creating this, uh, but you can also use that to to do more extensive um, management without, you don't have to have Active Directory to do this, but if you have one in a more elaborate deployment, it's certainly an option. Uh, Windows and Linux, a number of different image types that'll be available of this. Uh, there are, you know, I mentioned the, the client options in addition to hardware thin clients. You've got Windows, iPad, Mac OS, Android, Chromebook, Fire, uh, a number of different support options. We're going to be playing with the web access client today for the purposes of this demo. And there are, I just want to also, anybody who's not very experienced with AWS already, there's tremendous wealth of documentation on this. There's a, a really good getting, getting started guide for, for this quick setup that's kind of similar to what we'll be doing today that's available, you know, linked from the page, you know, the homepage for workspaces and really practically anything you want to do in AWS, there are going to be terrific tutorials deployed in, in AWS's tools themselves and available 
online for these. So we encourage you to, to not be intimidated by any of this and to, uh, to just dive in and uh, read and, and try a lot of this. All right, so I'm gonna step into the console and we are going to get started. Um, inside of, from the, assuming you've logged into your account, inside of services, we're gonna to go to workspaces and we're going to get started. That uh, getting started guide link from right here, really good information for, for getting off the ground. We're going to use the quick setup. Quick setup does a few things behind the scenes for you. Uh, it doesn't make use of any type of more extensive directory connection like an AD on-premise directory. This uses a, an AWS, simple deployment of an AWS directory service. Uh, does that behind the scenes. Um, this is compatible with the free tier. Both of these are compatible with the, the free tier availability. Um, it will default to the region that you're set up in. So in our case, I'm set for North Virginia, and uh, which is a supported region for workspaces. So the desktop will be created in that AWS region. Uh, a few other things to note that are automatic with this. Um, that's probably the most important part of this. I think the big emphasis is that, you know, quick setup is great for a limited use uh, where you would really want to get into the advanced is if you were doing more elaborate, you know, interconnectivity between on-prem and cloud or uh, greater configuration of some of the app deployment services that are available to this. We'll talk a little bit about that later. So we're going to launch this quick setup. This thing really is ridiculously easy and a minimal number of steps to stand this up. So first you, you can see here a, a set of the different, a number of the different offerings of kind of the, the image types, the desktop types, not necessarily images that are available. We're gonna play with a standard Windows 10 today. You can see that this one is free tier eligible. There is also wanna make note of this standard desktop that's already equipped with Office 2016. Um, there is an additional fee for that that accommodates for the licensing, Office 2016 licensing built into this. So uh, for anyone who needs to deploy a desktop that doesn't already have 365 uh, or their own licenses for this that are readily available, this would be your option. It's to stand this up with uh, with one of these, but again, note that that's, that's a paid tier because of the addition of the, of the office licensing. So we're gonna start with the Windows 10, uh, the free one. We're gonna create a, uh, start with a user here. Um, we're gonna play around with uh, Silicon Valley here a little bit. So you're going to give this a, a username, which is a login. Yeah, some identifying credentials here of who that person is and an email address for them. And then you're going to hit launch workspace. You could create additional users for this desktop if you wanted to. We're going to keep it simple, one person desktop here. And at this point, it is that's it. It's launching a it's launching a desktop. This is about a 20 minute process for this to happen. So I'm gonna cheat and jump into another window where I've already created one of these, or a couple of them actually. So we've got a Gavin Belson and Lori Bream's desktops here that are, that are already spun up in another account. Um, back over here in the one that, that is creating, it'll it takes a while, it's establishing, provisioning this machine, Behind the scenes, it created a directory, or it's, it's creating a directory inside of Amazon that will house all of the users that you create and that you can provision for this. Uh, it'll start creating that, that desktop over time and eventually it'll pop up in here with a number of different uh, status indicators. So once that's created, it's going to look like this. You would see one or more of your desktops available on this screen. 
Uh, you can navigate around everything on the left here, the directories and forces, the directory it creates that houses all of your users and controls access to your desktops. The workspaces are the workspaces you create, and we'll talk about these other options in a few minutes. Hey, so, Jeremy, yes. I, th I think you're pointing to a screen that you're not sharing. Oh, just a not mistake. Yeah, let me, uh, thank you. Let me, let me just share my whole desktop. That'll be a little bit easier, probably. Okay, can everybody see both, uh, both windows now? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Sorry about that. All right, so, um, so you can see here that we've got the two created desktops. So what you're going to do once you have, once the desktop uh, moves to a status of available, we're going to expand this. This gives you all the information about it, including what you'll need to log in. Since I'm going to be using the the web client, there is an additional step involved with configuring this for the web client. Uh, we need to go into, I gotta remember where it is. In the, into the directory and we're going to, in the details for this directory. And again, this directory is what's setting up our access control and, and our options for our users that will be using these. We've got to go into the um, access control options and enable for web access. Web access is not enabled by default when you stand this up with simple. It's enabled for the iOS, Android, Chrome, and Zero clients. Uh, turning on web, set, web access is a additional option uh, but it's as simple as clicking that update and exit and now we're enabled for the web access of this desktop so that is the one kind of gotcha in setting this up if you're using a web client and not um, a downloaded fat client on your machine so with that done we're going to go back to our workspace here there's a handy link to the clients from here We're going to hit this web access. And we want our registration code. This registration code is what you'll use for any client that identifies the workspace you're connecting to. And I neglected to create a password for Lori. So what happens when you, when you sign up a user, they receive an email message with a link to create their password. So you see here that this was sent over for Lori. She would come to this link, choose her new password. that into the console here and give it a moment to connect. And at this point, we're going to enter a fully configured managed Windows 10 workstation available through a web client. Uh, a few things I'll note about this, this service deployed in this manner. Um, you don't have access to your local computer with this, uh, that's by design. If you need to get files from a local device or from, from other locations, a number of options available to you. In a more, probably a more elaborate situation, you might, using a, an AD on-prem connection, you might uh, set up a, a VPN back into, or a connection back into your network to do mapped file shares, uh, certainly something a lot of people do with this. In a simpler, more rapid deploy scenario, something like Microsoft OneDrive, Google Drive, uh, AWS has a sync tool, a number of other ways to get your files into here and have sort of shared access to files. 
Uh, but these by default are meant to be very secure and very isolated uh, to keep any types of, um, you know, keep very tight control of what comes into and out of these environments. Uh, they're great for high compliance situations where you have to control, you know, movement of data. Uh, so it's a very, by definition, by intention, by design, a very highly secured solution. So what you see here is a, this is now we land on a uh, basic Windows 10 workstation desktop. Um, web browsing is up and running by default. We'll open up Firefox and do kind of inception here of a web browser within a web browser. You'll have to forgive me, I'm, I'm spoiled rotten on my Mac and I haven't used Windows in a little while, so if I do anything dumb. I'm gonna go download a, just an example of downloading and installing an app real quick. QPDF is always a good tool to have for making PDFs on the fly. Just like a local desktop, you can download and install applications as needed from here. So a few other things to note, there's a number of, of really good application deploy capabilities or options for you here. You can obviously download and install any, um, any software that's out there that you need. Uh, there is a really good application, sort of an app store type of, of capability for managing an inventory of available applications called the Workspaces Application Manager that you can use to do more more elaborate deployments with. Um, Amazon offers AppStream 2.0. It's a uh, stream virtualized app solution. All right, so we have installed Cute PDF and you'll see now that the Cute PDF writer is installed in this desktop. So again, the uh, you know very quick stand up. Uh, aside from that twenty minute wait to spin up the the desktop, having a fully functional Windows machine up and deployed and available for use is a relatively quick and painless operation. So I'll pause right there before I touch on a few other topics, uh, questions, additions, anything anybody wants to talk about with this so far? So something else I'll note is, especially if you had a situation where you wanted to deploy a number of these, uh, there's a a templating sort of, of solution available uh, using what are called images and bundles, where if you were to configure this desktop, say with your work, your working environment, you've, you've identified nine critical applications and configurations you need for your team. Um, you would go into this desktop. This is one of a few ways to do it. This is probably the simplest way without learning other technologies. Uh, you could go in, install a number of applications to this to this workspace, and then back from your uh, your console here, from this from this um, workspace, we could create an image. Uh, creating that image, it's just like a behaves just like a physical ghost or a disk image that you would make of a uh, of an on-prem workstation. 
based on that image, you can then spin up additional workspaces. So we could do all the work of configuring and installing the app set, the, the necessary workflow app set of a given example user within a team and turn that into an image in a bundle and then deploy 20 clones of that workstation all provisioned to different users so that you've got a really rapid way to give everybody on a team the same working set of applications and configurations if you needed to. Uh, the image process is slow, so I'm gonna cheat and just show where there's already one created. You, you can create an image based on a, the, a current state of a given workspace. With that image, you create a bundle, and JP or Zach, jump in, uh, jump in if I'm uh, misrepresenting anything here, because I'm not, uh, I've only done a little bit of work with the bundles. Um, but that, uh, that image, you, from the image, you create a bundle where you're corresponding that image with a given set of machine parameters, what's the OS, what, what's the available memory, and so forth. And then from there, you can launch additional workspaces. You choose your directory, which defaults to the one that it created for you. And you can you would create another user here. So um, I'm not sure that's how to spell his name, but uh, and I don't even think he has a last name. I don't think, or at least we've never known it. So we would create an additional user. And then now, in addition to all these other image op options, these uh, not image, um, these PC options you saw before, where we chose a Windows 10, we can scroll down to the bottom and see a, a where we took an image and included it in a bundle. And what we would do is create any number of new desktops using that bundle. And now you've got a fleet of desktops that all have a matching configuration based on that on that first sort of prototype that you use. So, again, the, the idea in the use case here is when approaching a business continuity situation or a disaster recovery situation, what you're looking for are the most essential apps that your team need. And I would even go beyond that to prioritize apps that aren't web-based already. Any, any installed uh, proprietary applications that you have, uh, anything with you know, more strict Lion, uh, license controls, um, anything that you have to install locally on a machine that's part of your essential work functions. Identify those apps, uh, do that, configure, build that prototype image with those apps on it. Anywhere that you can use web-based apps, continue to use those just to sort of lessen your transition effort. Uh, but once you've established so that core set of apps uh, in a prototype form for that team, you would use these bundles to now create a very manageable fleet of similarly configured machines. And um, you know, hopefully this is a good option to get a number of people very quickly into a remote, a remote desktop, remote work situation. Questions or comments? Can you briefly touch on um, the teardown of these and um, any sort of automation around um, creating new and removing when people leave the company, for example? JP, uh, could you speak to that? I think uh, I, don't, I don't have a lot of experience with that particular portion, but that's a terrific question because you know, in terms of the you know, scale of managing this and life cycle, um, definitely a lot of a lot of ability there. JP? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so everything on AWS, as you guys very well know, is APIs, right? So for every service we have, uh, everything that we do for interacting with the service is through an API, be it through the console, because the console under the hood does API calls, or through SDKs or through CLIs, right? So you can, of course, automate all of that using those APIs. Uh, in the case of the specific question around people leaving the company, joining the company, if you go to your favorite uh, search engine and type Workspaces DR, you're going to find a blog post that I did last year 
that this is specifically that. It, it was designed for, uh, for DR, but actually the automation that it uh, contains can also maintain a set of workspaces based on a, the presence of users on AD, right? So for example, some companies have uh, things like uh, Remedy or ServiceNow, and when they hire a user, there is a workflow that creates a user for, when they, they hire an employee, there's a workflow that creates a user on AD for the new employee. And when that's done, uh, this uh, automation piece is going to monitor the AD uh, uh, organizational unit or OU. And if there is a new user, it's going to create a workspace for that user, right? And in the same way, when you take a user off that OU by deleting it or moving it, uh, the automation will uh, destroy their workspace per se, right? So uh, there's other approaches to automation. There's another blog post that I did maybe two years ago, which uh, uses Amazon Lex, which is uh, a platform for building uh, chatbots on Amazon. And the chatbot interacts through Lambda with the APIs. And you can ask the chatbot you know, verbally or uh, through a web page, right? By typing uh, information to provision workspaces, to terminate workspaces. Uh, you can describe the workspaces that you have. So there are multiple ways for you to do that. Uh, and uh, the, the core of everything is of course the APIs. Does that answer the question? It does, yes, thank you. And I'm, I'm very new to the AWS space, so sorry uh, for those of you that knew that already. No, that was a great question. Same thing with API um, in terms of uh, templating. So templates that we've already built out. Um, we have a complex organization. It's, it's very difficult sometimes to standardize on an image. Um, so we certainly have a huge repository of different images based off of um, what the user is hired in for. So I would assume that from what I'm saying, it looks like those things are um, ingestible into AWS so that we wouldn't have to rebuild all of those images from scratch and then use an, uh, one that's in, been inherently built in AWS. Is that also correct? What are those yeah. images built in today? Are you using SCCM or? Uh... Yes, SCCM. Yeah, so if you want to bring your own image, there is a process for that available in workspaces. Uh, there, there are some, I wouldn't say restrictions, but some, you know, prerequisites that you need to have. And um, if you if you look at those images that we have there that are uh, being shown on on the uh, on the console there on Jeremy consoles, uh, they say Windows 10, Windows 7, but they are actually not pure Windows 10 or Windows 7 uh, desktop images. They are actually server images. Uh, in the case of Windows 7, it's Windows 2008 R2. In the case of Windows 10, it's Windows 2016 with the Dex desktop experience enabled, right? They're not native desktop images. And that that's because Microsoft does not allow AWS or any other provider to sell desktop images on multi-tenant uh, hosts or multi-tenant hardware, right? So all those instances, they are under the hood, they are all EC2, right? Which have a, uh, they have a, uh, a control plane and a wrap around it to make it uh, a mended desktop solution, which is workspaces. But they are all EC2 and they run on uh, multi-tenant hosts or hosts that have total isolation on the hypervisor layer between customers instances, but they are hosts that come, uh, 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 have a lot of e images from a lot of different customers, right? They're not just your images or ju just your instances. So we are not allowed to sell uh, desktop images because of that. And when you bring your own image, uh, the service team, the workspaces service team is going to build a control plane just for you on dedicated hosts to be compliant with Microsoft. Uh, 
licensing, you know, uh, descriptions and, and uh, requirements. So it is possible to do that. It, it is a work today that takes some time because the service team will have to build all this infrastructure just for you. It is not going to affect the price on any ways that become it more expensive. We are going to do that at no cost. And actually it's cheaper because each workspaces, if you, if you look at the Windows ones, uh, they have a $4 fee for the Windows license and we waive this $4 fee away from you if you opt for bringing your own uh, images, right? And, uh, and then you can do that. But uh, it takes some time, takes some time, maybe sometimes even two months, one month and a half, depending on the queue of customers that they have to do, that they have a, a line of customers waiting for that. And there are some requirements like you would need to have at least 200 workspaces to be able to be eligible for that. And uh, there's a web page that I can send you later on with all the requirements for bring your own license and bring your own image, right? But then when Microsoft audits you, you are responsible for providing the licenses to Microsoft. In the default way of provisioning workspace like Jeremy show, uh, just showed, uh, we are responsible for providing the licenses because the licenses are included. So if you go through an audit, you just tell Microsoft, go talk to Amazon because they own my licenses, right? Basically, I think yeah, there, another, there, there is a way for doing that. Thank you very much for that. And, and April, excellent question. I'm glad we got into, into that topic. I think another way of looking at it too, outside of the image, and I'm not sure how, how far you all have gone down this path, um, would be within SCCM, instead of specifically managing users app sets by image, um, having the SCCM packages of those apps or you know app sets based on packaging of the apps that you could deploy um, using using SCCM's you know individual app packages you with a with AD connectivity and with this solution connected into your network um, JP correct me if I'm wrong here I would imagine if you're into the network you could use SCCM to deploy your packages onto onto these workspaces would that is that a is that a capability that looks yeah. like i saw that but i wasn't i haven't done it myself no yeah absolutely uh, most enterprise customers i would say they use sccm for managing workspaces one of the public customers that i can uh, mention is johnson and johnson they have around 200 uh 25 000 workspaces actually running today and they manage all the workspaces uh, software delivery through SCCM. Um, there are other other tools that can do that. I think the Liquidware Labs is a very good partner from AWS and they have uh, another very good tool for doing that. You can uh, use also group policies, right? Some companies, they have just a web portal with all the their approved uh, software and the users can themselves you know in a self-service way he can choose the tools and install it by themselves uh and uh, that's how most most customers do you know uh most enterprise customers as jeremy mentioned they use sccm basically you can view the workspace in the same way that you view your current desktops you know you can manage it in the same way that you manage your current desktops, basically. The only difference is that the control plane and the infrastructure to provision the workspace is managed by AWS. Hey, hey JP, uh, while we're on that on that topic with SCCM, I noticed um, with uh, with the workspaces application manager, which behaves similarly to uh, to an app delivery. Uh, type of localized app store type of functionality that it can import packages of your sort of bring your own applications where it can bring packages in and deploy them with WAM. Um, you know, obviously WAM's a little bit more uh, a deeper topic that um, 
did, probably doesn't make sense to go too deep into today, but um, in the context of that, is there a prescribed um, migration path of taking a package designed for SCCM deployment and migrating that into WAM or into another tool that that has good native support in this uh, for a situation maybe where somebody doesn't have their environment, their on-prem environment, and their existing network tied into the cloud. Because you know, to to really get value out of SCCM in this situation, you would have to establish that tie between the VPC, I would imagine, and and the that um, that on-prem network. Uh, but without having a good setup to use your existing SCCM, could you migrate any of your SCCM packages into something like WAM? Uh, so SCCM, um, uh, WAM is a tool that is designed for small implementations, you know? So if you have 10, uh, 20 workspaces, I would recommend you to use WAM. More than that, I wouldn't being very honest with you, it, it is a tool really designed for small implementations. It, it's nothing comparable to SCCM. So first, there is no uh, migration tool or anything like that. They are totally different tools. And uh, SCCM is a really an enterprise grade tool, as well as Liquidware Labs and the other uh, third party tools. WAM is is good for small implementations, but I wouldn't use it for a large corporate implementation with hundreds of workspaces because I've, I've had uh, customers in the past trying to do that and the tool is a little bit uh, not that mature yet, to be very honest with you, for those size of implementations. So I would, I would use it for small implementations, for things that are simple, like with, uh, like you did here with simple AD and so on, but for carpet and uh, you know big types of implementations, I would stick with SCCM or Liquidware Labs, or uh, maybe you know delivering uh, software through group policies or using a self-service portal for software, and have your base image with the base software that you need, like. Uh, your trend micro antivirus, your, you know, whatever you need on the, on every image you can build to the golden image per se, right? That it's going to be attached to the bundle that you use. Uh, and then deliver the software that varies depending on the user profile with SCCM, Liquidware Labs, those kinds of tools for big implementations. Awesome, thank you. Sure. Other questions? Questions, ideas of other use cases, uh, situations that, that you might uh, find value in this? I don't want to monopolize, but I do have another question. Someone else does. Sure, please go ahead. So um, some of the other functionality and things that sort of help us today, we're, we're in uh, Citrix um, for the most part for our remote access, but we, we have multiple corporations, one of whom is moving heavily into the AWS space. And so they're starting to look at this. Um, can you maybe share or point me to um, some of the security uh, features from this uh, AD, AWS specific uh, workspace, things like uh, impossible travel. Um, I know there, there, there's information that we get today that I would just want to understand if we're able to get the same capabilities or more from AWS, and I'm not sure I would know exactly where we're looking right now. Yeah, sure. So, um, talking about encryption, for example, right? So. The workspace is actually, if you look at the workspaces instance, I have an architecture design here that I could show you uh, so you could understand a little bit better. But um, the instance is actually dual homed, right? There, is, there are two network interfaces on each workspaces instance. 
the first network interface is just for streaming, just for PC over IP. And we have a new protocol that is still in beta called uh, Workspaces Streaming Protocol, WSP, who was developed by Amazon. And it's very, very cool. It has a lot of interesting capabilities, uh, works very well with very high latencies. So we are going to, to be launching it um, globally available soon, but it, it's a stream beta. And uh, all the traffic that flows through that internet uh, or um, through that uh, network interface is encrypted with uh, by default with AES 256, right? So all the pixels that are streamed to the client, a web client or uh, the, the FAT clients that you install on the endpoints, they are encrypted in transit, right? So it's all pixels, no actual data, right? Uh, all pixel information, uh, only the delta is actually streamed on the Wally, on, only what changes on the screen is actually sent and it is encrypted with, by default with AES 256. You can change that, but uh, that's the default security bar. On the data on at rest, so the workspaces have two uh, volumes attached to them, right? Drive C and drive D on the operating system. Those two volumes can also be encrypted and the keys can be managed by AWS Key Management Service, KMS. So that's going to give you uh, encryption at rest and encryption in transit of the data that flows through the client, right? Or to the client in this case. For all the rest of the data, it flows through a network interface, an EN ENI, if you are familiar with the term on AWS, uh, elastic network interface that is extended to your VPC, right? So to your network environments on AWS. And all the rest of the data, the, the data that the user goes fetch to a database on AWS, on-prem, whatever it is, or the data that go, uh, the user go fetches on the internet through your egress points, be it inside of AWS or routed to your CorpNet uh, through a VPN or direct connect. All this data needs to be encrypted by you, right? Because uh, if you're doing a, uh, HTTPS call at the layer seven, you're already encrypting it. But if you are, if you have, for example, a client server application connecting to a database, you need to make sure you use an OD, uh, ODBC or JDBC driver that uses a certificate to encrypt that uh, connection as well, right? So uh, in the end of the day, you can encrypt everything on REST and in transit, right? So that's encryption. For things like uh, preventing the user from uh, copying data or copying information back and forth from the workspace to his uh, local desktops, or um, there are a couple of uh, things that you can prevent. And uh, for that, there is a, a group policy template that comes with every workspace. On, uh, on the C drive, I can send you the, the, the path later on if you want. And with that template, you can customize, the administrator can customize a lot of things that he allows the user to do or he doesn't allow the user to do on the workspace. And he can deploy that uh, group policy on the OU of the uh, Active Directory or even to, to, the, to the, the whole uh, domain of Active Directory and prevent the user from interacting with some aspects of the workspace. And even tweaking streaming uh, en encryption protocols and, and uh, algorithms, things like that. So the, this, is, this is actually done through group policies. Does that answer the question? Yes, it does. Thank you very much. Sure. And JP, I wanna call out one more thing. Um, you know, guys, and it's just something to be mindful of as we look at, and obviously you guys understand more about AWS services. We also have, and, and 
I don't know if this is necessarily relevant to the workspaces piece, but I just want to call it to your attention, is we also have a solution called AWS Marketplace. And Marketplace is our digital catalog um, where we have thousands of software listings from our independent software vendors that are part of our partner community. And what it allows our customers to do is test, um, buy, and deploy software that runs on AWS. So, you know, I know you mentioned in your example, you know, Citrix. Uh, what I would say is, you know, as you guys start down the journey with AWS, if there's software that you guys are looking at, is Marketplace is a great mechanism to take a peek at. Great tool. Cool, thank you. So a couple other things I'll note, uh, note real quick. Uh, we focus today on workspaces, again, uh, you know, out of an effort to hopefully provide some, some rapid deploy solutions for remote work capability uh, from the desktop standpoint. A few other products, services from AWS that also sort of fit into this remote transition uh, I've got pulled up on, on the screen here. Amazon Chime is Amazon's answer to Zoom. Uh, essentially, it's a um, remote uh, conferencing tool. Amazon Connect, uh, actually, we've used uh, Connect pretty extensively to build IVR capabilities with, uh, but a number of, of uh, kind of communications and um, phone-based and messaging tools uh, really really good automation and development kit with that. AppStream 2.0, we mentioned before, that's a streamed application solution, uh, kind of similar to ZenApp, if, uh, it might be a bad analogy, but it's in that space of, of taking individual apps uh, without a full desktop experience and just and streaming a specific app to your users or making use of a catalog of apps that are already packaged and and ready to be streamed that are that are already native and available in that solution. Uh, another really quick stand up within a matter of minutes, you can be using some of the AppStream 2.0 apps that Amazon already makes available. Uh, and then WorkDocs, um, I don't have experience with WorkDocs myself. Uh, JP and Zach, this is essentially uh, sort of your answer to like a 365 or Google Docs, right? Like a, a, a productivity suite. It, you know, spreadsheet, documents, slideshows. Is that right? Uh, yeah, it's a it's a collaboration and basically a file sharing tool, right? So, with Workspaces, actually, uh, WorkDocs is a, a good companion tool for Workspaces, and it's very cheap, actually. So, if you use, I think it's even mentioning it there on the screen. If you use uh, WorkDocs with Workspaces, you pay basically one dollar for one terabyte of storage space on WorkDocs, and um, yeah, it's basically if you want to do an analogy, maybe uh, uh, Dropbox or Google oh, Drive okay. is a better. So it's analogy. more of a so it's a collab, not exactly, not really the the app set, but it's a collab. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And then AppStream has a built-in deployment for I think it's Open Office, isn't it? One of the one of the uh, open source office suites is available natively out of AppStream for very quick deployment. Uh, one other thing that's not um, these are they. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, actually, AppStream has a demo environment that you can you know play with just to see how AppStream works with uh, uh, Open Office. But uh, AppStream has a, uh, an image builder concept where you can install your own catalog of software and you can, of course, use uh, OpenOffice there. But uh, yeah, the OpenOffice image that you're mentioning actually is the, the trial that they have available on the console for you to play with and, and see how it works. And then back, stepping back into the workspaces, you know, for anybody that needed to deploy a full-blown office, of course, you have the paid version of a workspace desktop that already has office installed and pre-configured. 
Uh, you could do your own install. Um, 365 for anybody who needs it is also a great solution. You know, with the web access and the capabilities that these workspaces have, logging in and uh, using your 365 existing 365 license is also very available. Uh, one other thing to note here, these are the some AWS remote work solutions uh, that are available and that AWS is, is providing extensive um, no charge usage of between now and June 30th. Uh, Trend has also extended a similar offer of their worry-free product uh, for securing uh, to, that can be installed on these workspaces to secure them also free through that timeline. So anybody deploying this that, uh, that wants the, uh, and, and just, I think the worry-free includes, it's kind of a comprehensive security solution. It's got AV, malware, and everything built into it. So you could stand up a free workspace with this till June 30th um, and then use, uh, if you needed AV on, and you know security tools on that, uh, that trend solution is a good free solution that's out there for the same time period. Anybody who's interested in that, uh, you're welcome to, uh, to follow up with Justin Nelson afterwards. Um, uh, and thanks Trend again, uh, Trend uh, generously gave us their Zoom conference to use for this again today. And it's been a, a great partner to the local AWS community uh, and, and helped us uh, coordinate this with, um, with AWS. Uh, you, you a tremendous thank you to, to JP and Zach for joining us and being able to, to speak to this in far greater depth than I possibly could. Uh, one other thing to note, uh, we record all of these sessions. Um, it maintains a, a YouTube channel where we deploy all of the, uh, the videos of these for reference or for sharing after the fact. Um, so we encourage you to, to go there afterwards if you, if you need to revisit any of, the, any of this or share it. Uh, I can also make available a um, sort of a step-by-step. -step. Anybody who wants to go through this, you're welcome to follow up with with me directly, uh, or I can um, shoot out a uh, sort of a PDF walkthrough of the steps that I use to create this workspace for today. And then uh, also encourage, in addition to, to joining our YouTube channel, uh, also encourage you to, to join the Magic City Slack group. There's an AWS channel there, and we try to, we try to share information on that also. So an overriding goal of a lot of this, aside from just um, today's immediate topic is is continuing to to connect our community the, the aws users and enthusiasts in the birmingham area uh we we hope that this talk and sort of exposure to this particular solution will be timely with the the necessity of warm, remote work transitions um you'll find that many people in this group are very approachable and are more than happy to to help with people who are completely naive to the AWS toolset. Uh, we we want this to not be an intimidating technology, and we want to do what we can to further the usage of this in Birmingham and to bring together the users of this technology so we can sort of all learn from each other and uh, share ideas and tips and tricks and everything. And so um, Ed and I have been continuing behind the scenes to try to build up a wider community and tool set and uh, sort of resource sharing uh, set of solutions for this and we'll continue to tell you more about that over the coming over the coming months. We are seeking to continue this trend. Uh, we're working through a date and specifics of our next topic for May. Uh, look for an announcement on that probably in the next in the next week of the topic and date of our next session that will be virtual again. And we will continue to try to take this tactic of, of good hands-on examples of implementing a, um, a given AWS service or services toward a specific use case. Ed, anything else you wanna add for today? Hey, no, nothing from my side. You covered it all, Jeremy. Thank okay. you. Justin, thank you and Trend as always for uh, for being a, a great partner and uh, enabling a lot of this for us. JP and Zach, again, can't thank you guys enough for, for lending your, your expertise to this conversation. Uh, hey, Jeremy.
Yeah. Can I can I add one more information before we close? Please do. Please do. So uh, the workspace is talking about costs. The workspace has two running modes, as you you guys saw during uh, Jeremy's provisioning phase. There, uh, one running mode is called Always On, where the workspace is always available, is always running. The instance is always running, so the user connection experience is immediate. And on this one, AWS is going to charge a flat fee per month. So when you provision a workspace, we get that flat fee and that's going to be charged on your, on your regular billing cycle with AWS. And the other running mode is called auto stop. And uh, this one, there is a flat fee, uh, a reduced flat fee, which is, uh, uh, which refers to licensing and things on the control plane that we cannot charge by the hour. And uh, the most part of it is, is, the, is an hourly charge. So when the, the user is actually using the workspace, connected to the workspace, the workspace, even though the name is auto stopped, it's not actually stopped. It's only in hibernation, right? So the workspace is going to come back from hibernation in one or two minutes, the user is able to connect and then we start charging this, uh, this hourly fee, right? And normally the decision criteria there is, and that's based on a lot of studies that we, we did with uh, other customers is normally the break even is around 80, 82 hours a month. So the, if the user uses the workspace for more than 82 or 80 hours a month, normally uh, always on makes more sense. It gets cheaper. If it's less than that, uh, auto stop makes more sense, right? So just wanted to give you guys that information so you you are able to make decisions when you are provisioning the workspace based on the user profile, right? On And uh, how the user is going to use the workspace. And also if you, I, I can add the link here too. Uh, there is a solution that uh, one member of our SME team did that's based on Lambda, Fargate, and, and uh, uh, SNS and some other services that is going to analyze the CloudWatch metrics around that and can take decisions for you around that. So it's going to analyze the user profile. If the user uses the workspace for some days, it is going to have data to make that decision for you. And it, it can change the instance uh, running mode automatically for you, or it can give you a recommendation, right? So basically it's going to drop a CSV file on S3 and you can access the CSV file, look at it and see how the users are using the workspace and take decisions yourself if you want, right? So just wanted to uh, throw that in as a, an additional information. Great, thank you. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll We'll get together with JP and Zach and uh, and get a, a communication out to everyone who joined a recap of this with um, links to the YouTube channel where the video will be posted, a step-by-step -step, uh, of the same walkthrough that I did essentially for reference if anyone needs it, and uh, any of these, any other resource links that we've mentioned um, in the call, we'll make sure that we get that circulated to everybody afterwards. Uh, and of course, if you have any other questions, please reach out to us. Um, and we want to, we definitely want this to be an open conversation with everybody involved. So that's, that's all I've got for today. Uh, any, any other questions before we, before we adjourn? All right. Well, guys, thank you all very much. Uh, thank you, big thank you to AWS and Trend for their participation and, and for all of you joining us virtually. It's, it's terrific to be able to, to keep the community together and, and growing and, uh, and have everybody um, sort of keeping our momentum and, and talking each month. So we'll look forward to seeing you all again in May. Everybody take care and stay well.